The eastern terminus of the road was a long pier, some 1,250 feet in length, extended out to Lake Champlain from the New York Shore of Rouse's Point. Also note the depot dock, the Steamboat Hotel and Depot. Trains were driven right into the building underneath the guest rooms. And if you can imagine back then, you rented a hotel room, you've got engines, steam locomotives, bellowing smoke coming in underneath you. Uh, a great way, you pay a lot of money to stay there, right? Um, this was the hotel, and then you see the tracks that came in under the shed. Can you go to the next one? This is a hand drawing of that hotel. That's at the end of the dock, and then you can see the shed underneath where the trains came in under. It was very hard trying to find some pictures of this building. Um, this photo was about 1860, and of course you can see a steamboat docked at the end where passengers can get off and also could transfer to trains. This is on the south side of the hotel. The hotel was some 600 feet long and 100 feet wide. <coughs> or to a tornado hit the building, tearing it off the roof, and after that, it was completely torn down. Um, this is the best picture that I could find of the uh, hotel. That's the front end at the dock, and then this is the long shed. You can see they started taking some of the dormers off that used to be there. A bunch of boats docked up against it, so it was a pretty popular place. Um, this is around 1865. Okay. There had been three bridges, although maybe four, maybe five, uh, built by railroads from Rouse's Point to Vermont. The first was built because of the ingenuity of Henry Campbell, of, sorry, Henry Campbell of the Vermont and Canada Railroad and Charles Slatter of the Northern Railroad, a system by which a 301-foot barge was to be placed in the middle of a 5,000 290 foot structure that could swing aside whenever lake traffic warning. A boiler and steam winch were placed on a barge and a system of chains were rigged through blocks that would allow the whole unit to be swung out at right angles in a couple of minutes. Which is kind of amazing back then, you move this barge across the lake to open it up and it can be done in a couple of minutes. And the reason I tell you this is because as we see with a number of bridges, you would think as we get more modern, it'd be simpler and simpler, but it doesn't turn out that way. In January 31st, 1880, the Northern Railroad was reorganized and became the Ogdensburg and Lake Champlain Railroad. Same argument, same, you know, hundred something years later. Uh, 
And some of the reason, some of the reasons for the, the curves too, from Carabusco to Ross's Point, is because of the grade, of course. And that story really covers that well. There's a series of uh, engineers call them reverse curves, basically. It helps gain speed or, or slow you down, depending on the, which way you're going west or east. Uh, but if you see Clint Mills and Cherubusco, uh, I see some people from that area. Helenberg, you'll know that obviously it gets, there's a big elevation drop from here to there. So that's why you see all that kind of figuration. So, yeah. Earlier it was mentioned that three bridges were built across the lake. And I said maybe four, maybe five. Well, the Champlain St. Lawrence Railroad proposed a bridge connected with the existing bridge at the state line. As far as we know, it was never built, and what we're talking about is this section here. Was proposed. We don't think it's built. We've never seen any proof that it was built, but we have yet this map by the Champlain St. Lawrence Railroad about cutting across and connecting basically at the state line to go across. They had tracks going here. Why they wouldn't have done that, who knows? So now the ONLC has control. Um, this is the yard of the ONLC. They have a round <coughs> They still use the dock. The bridge hasn't been built yet. So the original bridge was taken down, and then about 1880, um, this new timber draw bridge was installed. This is a pole star showing that bridge. This is a view from that pier we keep talking about with the tracks at Russell's Point of the new bridge. And actually, it's being constructed. The towers aren't complete, they're just vertical, there's no cross members. And it looks like the lower bridge is covered in a curve. You can't really see any of the trusses or anything. But it appears to be in the middle of construction. And here's another shot, a bunch of workers. The, it still isn't completed. They're still putting it together. And this was a how-type swing and bridge with a high central power on this. And it basically swung on a pivot. Um, these rods were over two inches thick with turnbuckles passed to each end of the truss to sort of tie it all together. And here you can see it in the open position. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Now, remember I talked the original bridge was pretty <coughs> simple. Steam engine, winch, block and tackle, they could open in a few minutes. Think a more modern bridge, it would be easier to open. Well, not so. Um, the bridge was operated by manual labor in the following manner. On the central pier bed was a large wooden pier of laminated oak securely bolted to the framing. A pinion gear, much smaller in size, attached to a pinion shaft with a square socket end and attached to the drawbridge over operated the structure. Two or more men, using a hardwood lever inserted into the square end of the pinion shaft, walk around on the platform in the center of the span, and by this means, in the space of five to ten minutes, depending on the wind and other conditions, could fully open the drawbridge. So before they had a nice steam engine, it was easy to open. Now they're opening it by hand. In the early 1900s, the Rutland Railroad began to acquire much heavier locomotive power, and it was decided that the old timber bridge would have to be replaced with a steel one. And then, <coughs> the American Bridge Company of New York installed this bridge in the winter of 1905 and 1906. The reason it was built during the winter is they didn't have to worry about traffic having to pass through the bridge. And this is the new layout of the bridge, which is right here. <coughs> and we'll, sh we'll show you a close-up later. Um, next one. This is a shot of 
the bridge. <coughs> This is a shop during construction. It's almost completed. The bridge swings on a center pier. It is 213 feet in length with a central tower containing the engine for the opening drop. And the engine was in this shack up here. Now, if you remember, it took the barge with a steam engine a couple of minutes to open. It took the wood trestle using two men, sometimes more, by hand, five to ten minutes to open the wood trestle. Now we have a modern bridge with a gasoline engine. So supposedly it should be easy to open. It is. The problem was starting the engine. <laughs> Keep in mind that the bridge tender had to go up here and go inside to start the engine. The engine for operating the drop is rather unusual in character. The engine built and installed in 1906 is a 15 horsepower Fairbanks Morse gas engine, which is light with a match. It will not run otherwise, as was proven some years ago. The old engine tender died, and a new man was sent to take his place. The location of the metal box in which his predecessor had kept the old type stick or phosphor matches was not established by considerable search. The new type matches were tried without success, even with the highest test gasoline obtainable. All sorts of attempts were made to start the engine without matches, but to no avail. There was only one way to start the engine, which to a casual examination looks like any other gas engine, except it is larger than the present one-cylinder engines of similar horsepower. And the fact that in the center of the cylinder head is a brass plunger-like device about six inches in length. The operation is this. First, unscrew the brass plunger, break off about an inch of a stick match, and place it in the match slot, the plunger position being extended. On the plunger piston is a piece of sandpaper-like substance, so when the piston plunger is struck and forced into the plunger, the abrasive will ignite the match. The plunger is now screwed into the cylinder head. Next, about a cup full of gasoline is poured into the primer cup on top of the cylinder. The valve opens and the, gust and the gas is thus poured into the cylinder, the valve again being closed. At the side of an engine is a hand-operated pump, similar to a tire pump, but some, somewhat larger. The next step is to grasp the flywheel of the engine with the left hand and hold it so that it cannot rotate, while with the right hand, the air pump is operated until pressure is built up in the engine cylinder. You then reach down with your third hand and close the valve in the pipe from the air pump to the cylinder. Meanwhile, still holding tightly on the flywheel so it cannot turn. The final step in the process is to yank the flywheel towards you, and at the same instant, with the flat of your hand, strike sharply on the end of the brass piston plunger containing the match. There will only be a second of indecision as to whether or not she will start, since if she does, the resultant explosion will be heard some distance even in a thunderstorm. <laughs> If she doesn't, you simply repeat, repeat the process until she does. So that's how you use this modern technology. Okay, this is the view of the drawbridge in the open position from the lake. And this is from the trestle, again in the open position. Okay, this is just to orient you with the next couple of pictures coming up. Um, that's the circle is how the bridge would open and close. It would go in that radius. It would sit on this pier. There's a custom house here, which we'll see later. There's a tower for controlling the railroad, the trains coming through. There's also a uh, bridge tender's house. Construction had just been completed, and this shows the drawbridge, the 
tower and the custom house. And we're looking west. This is another shot, a little closer up. Again, it shows the drawbridge, the tower, and you can just barely see the custom house here. This is the same view, but you'll notice the custom house is not now gone. It's no longer used. This is a view looking west. Uh, he's ready to go four-wheeling. <laughs> this is uh, the drawbridge again from the last coach of the westbound milk train number seven in 1950. Uh, rear view of train heading east, Bridge Tender's house is on the left. And this is, I think, really the only picture I've seen that shows it. In 1909, there was a washout, and yet people were allowed to walk on this, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Nowadays, with lawsuits and everything, you wouldn't think that would happen. Another shot, people standing by the tracks. I had one other picture, which I didn't bring because it was very fuzzy, but it had three or four ladies all dressed in their Sunday best, two guys with bowlers on, standing, having their picture taken, standing on the bridge. <laughs> of course, being on the lake, high water, caused all sorts of problems. And this could have been the reason uh, why the custom house disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's really kind of interesting is that here's a, a passenger car way up here, and yet here's a locomotive way down here. It's too bad we, didn't get a sh we just couldn't see a shot from the other side to see what was really happening. So of course, the bridge is the right. Officials go out there to see what's going on and how they're going to fix it. And then you've got to have the workers who are going to fix it take care of it. They put it back in operation. Windblown ice pushed the Rouse's Point excuse me, Ross's Point trestle out of alignment and it uh, caused a lot of problems as you can see. Our next one. This shows ribbon being placed because they're going to remove the locomotive that fell in the way. And of course you can see they're lifting it out, you can just barely see it right there. This is a view of the engine in the water. This accident happened April 2nd, 1920, when the Rutland engine, the heavy Mikado, number 33, slid into the cold waters of the lake west of the drop. Even though the water was very cold and completely covered the engine, the six men who were in the cab escaped with only getting wet. They were engineer Norman Grutten, conductor Jack Vinson, fireman Gut, Gut Rice, brakeman Charles Chevalier, and Clyde Moore and Rouse's Point second trick operator, Bill Blaney, who was on his way home to Albert. So after a year of being in the water, engine number 33 is lifted out. Of course, along with the engine, it took its tender out as well. And here it is sitting at Albert Yards. You see the Albert Brown House in the background. Okay, now we've talked a lot about the pier, we're going to talk some more, and here it's coming into Rouse's Point. <coughs> the other thing I want you to remember towards the end of this first part is this cribbing right here. And this is a view from Rouse's Point. There's the Rutland Pier, or the OLC before that, where they used to store their freight cars. And then this is a picture of the bridge in the background. Again, you can see tracks here, uh, boats, dock events next to the dock. And of course, people getting off steamboats as well, just walking down the tracks. This is a view from Albert, from Windmill, um, excuse me, Windmill Point. And this is where the railroad left state of Vermont and started to cross the lake. And of course, that's what remains at this point on the state of Vermont side. We went there with blocks of uh, marble for ballast. And this is sort
sort of what it looked like back then. You also notice that the Rutland tracks have been removed. The Rutland and the CD, it, it's interesting, the history, you would think railroads would work together, but no, no, they can't help each other out. Even though they both shared the bridge, neither one could use the other's tracks. So, as you saw previous, there were two sets of tracks, one for the Rutland, one for the CB, even though you couldn't have two trains on the bridge at the same time, but they had to have their own set of tracks. <coughs> Here's showing the milk train slowly crossing the trestle about 1950. And then another milk train again, uh, color, which actually looks a lot nicer. The end of the train. And then as it looks today, you can just barely see some of the piers sticking out of the water. And this is train number seven coming into Rouse's Point in 1951. And there's a view from Rouse's Point, train coming in on Trussell. And then engine 91 arriving at Rouse's Point. <coughs> this is train number seven arriving at Rouse's Point with engine 75 in the lead. Again, as we talk, the Rutland used the right, right hand pair of gauntlet tracks that it shared with the CB. This is looking east towards Albert. And you can tell the Rutland wasn't running anymore because they're all rusted. While the CB was still operated and the rails were shining. This is a view towards the end from the top of the drawbridge. The tracks are still there, both of them, uh, but it's towards the end. And of course, this is from Rouse's Point, it's cross -butt. the tracks are no longer used, the end is coming. Um, this is when either, track, uh, either railroad was using it, basically the structure was abandoned in place, and then they slowly took down the drawbridge. And then here's an aerial view of a uh, walkway. I guess for a while it was a fishing pier by the, used by the New York State for people to go fish off. Uh, Vermont basically abandoned its part of it. And then I apologize, this slides backwards, but we're looking towards Vermont from the pavilion where the marina is. We're looking towards Vermont, and that's what's left of the Vermont side of it. Now, we talked about there were three bridges. There was actually a fourth. Uh, no pictures of it. It was removed in uh, 1885. But that bridge was for the Lamoille Valley Extension, which was part of the St. JNLC, or the St. John's and Lake Champlain Railroad. Here's the Rutland seat in central Vermont, running along here. And off, coming off Windmill, Windmill Point is where they connected <coughs> New York. The Memorial Valley Extension is coming here. <coughs> so you can see where the old bridge was, this is the green now. And the Memorial Valley Extension headed here. <coughs> At the time when Lamoille Valley Extension was built, it was the Northern Railroad and the Vermont Central Railroad. The Vermont Central owned the Vermont side of the bridge, and the Northern had the New York State side of the bridge. Lamoille Valley Extension was a direct competitor with Central Vermont. We wanted to get to New York State. The Central Vermont said, you're not using our bridge. So Lamoille Valley Extension negotiated with the Northern Railroad, and basically connected on the New York State side of the bridge, avoiding, oops, sorry, avoiding dealing with Vermont Central. And you can go to the next one. And this shows that here it's coming off. They connect here. Here's the state line. 
to hear Vermont Central coming in. So again, here's Vermont Central and Rutland going across. Here's Lamoille Valley Extension taking a direct route. Boom. Once the Lamoille Valley Extension got across the bridge, they could compete with Central Vermont. Central Vermont didn't like it. So what did the Central Vermont do? It bought the Lamoille Valley Extension. The tracks that they had just laid six months later were ripped up <coughs> by Vermont Central and they eliminated their competition and sold the railroad. So four bridges, but we don't have anything other than a couple of drawings and some remaining grades. And there's actually, on Vermont side, under on the navigation map, there's piers just below the water. So there's an idea of how the bridge was going, how the bridge had been done. So that's the first part of the show. Can you give us a second instead of the second? You're not going to see a lot of DNA, and it's not because we don't like the DNA, we just don't know that much about it. We know more about the rubble. We don't want to invent any DNA. So now we're going to talk about Rouse's Point, and basically the east end of the ONLC, which in my eyes was from <coughs> Rouse's Point to Chattagay. Um, like I said, there's a mix of historical, there's a lot of stations. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Well, I don't, I don't really know if I have to tell anybody here. I think most of you folks know where, the, where Ross Point came from, or how Ross Point was derived from uh, Jack Ross. Uh, so here in 1783, we just always think that there's a lot of people. We, we did this presentation for another group, and they weren't familiar with Ross Point. We had the, what's called the Rutland Railroad Historical Society, uh, which we were a part of. And we go to different locations. This year we happen to be in Ross Point area. So we threw this slide in to explain Ross's point. So it's pretty self-explanatory and the way it was about before. And that's all we're here to do is to share information. Uh, every time we do one of these things, we learn from other people. So somebody in this audience may teach us something. They always do. And uh, so we're trying to tell everybody, who, everybody a little history of what Ross's point is all about and how important it was on the railroad center anyway. There was five railroads that came to Ross's point at one time. And, uh, I know I'm going to miss one, of course, the Rutland, D&H, Naperville Junction, Canadian National, what's the other one? CV. CV, thank you very much. I always miss one. <coughs> Portland 
through the St. Johnsbury, and actually it doesn't show up, but it was, there was the St. JNLC went from St. Johnsbury to Swanton and then connected with this. Even though that railroad at one time was all built, all the sections were never built at the same time. This is an aerial view of uh, Rouse's Point, just to give you an idea. Um, here's the old uh, trestle. So the Rutland came in, crossed here, crossed the DNH at this point, and then continued west. And then here's the dock that they used for tracks. And this is where that hotel used to sit. On the end of that dock, trains came in underneath it. This is a picture of the Rouse's Point station um, that was built. Uh, during the ONLC, when ONLC had control. And at that point, um, in fact, you know it was the ONLC Railroad, Central Vermont had control over it. Because you'll notice, um, well, we had showed you a bunch of stations. This was a typical Central Vermont station. It was used in um, Bethel, it was used in Oakland Station, which is Georgia, it was used in Williston. This was also used at Ogdensburg on the other side of the lake. It was used at Chattagay, Chester on Rutland. So it was a, a typical station that, we used, that was used a lot. Um, you can also see the old water tower in the back, and then we're also looking towards the lake. And then we're looking back towards the lake. You can see the water tower off to the side. We're a busy place, lots of cars and stuff. It was uh, quite a happening place. Another shot of Russell's Point Station was sort of looking west. Another one a little more close up. You can also see the Custom House in the background, Custom and Integration Building, which later became the station when they took this down. Um, some workers standing in front of the station. Um, we assume they're railroad workers, but we don't know. We found the photo of kind of neat, so we included it. <laughs> this is pulling to Rouse Point heading west. Even though the engine is stuck at the freight house, it's really for the passenger cars to unload. Down at the station, there's a couple of milk cars on there. Nice little mixed train. Okay, this is the old immigration custom house that also became a station. The freight house is there. The station is gone. The brick, old brick station is gone. <coughs> this is a later view. Uh, I always like color we can use that. Nice old freight house. Unfortunately, they're both gone. This one lasted a little longer. It just passed away. This is a shot. Uh, oops, not a word. Okay. This is train. No. I screwed this up. Sorry. Um, okay. This is pulling to us. No. It's a nice picture. <laughs> yeah. There's the fray house there. Let's try next. Okay. This is the old building after it was no longer used. Basically sat vacant, and then just before it was about to come down. Now, just to sort of orient everybody, um, that's backwards, I'm sorry. It is backwards. Um, this is actually supposed to be on the top and supposed to be on the bottom, but I mainly put it in to show there was the station, there was the custom house, and then there was the freight. So we get an idea of where they were in relationship to each other. And then I'll oh, 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 go back to the quick second. And you know this is backwards, this is where it crossed with the DH. And the station for the DH currently sits there. <laughs> Milk 
train number eight crossing the DH, the NH tracks at Russell's Point. Uh, this is the shanty that sort of controlled everything that was going on and who could cross and who had to wait. The Rutland always, as I understood it, always had to wait and get approval from the DNH before they could cross. Another view of the cross, uh, the crossing shanty is dying in. Someone's sitting there watching what's going on. <coughs> this is engine four or five, just about to cross the diamond. Again, the crossing shanty is right there. This will be the DNH track. <coughs> You can see the signals here which control when the rubber is crossing and when it's This is locomotive 56. It's crossing the diamond with the B and H. Of course, you've got one looking out the window, one standing back there. I don't know who's driving the trains. <laughs> This is um, <coughs> from the crossing shanty. It's behind us and looking towards the DH. And you can see the diamond has been removed at this point. Yeah. This crossing, here's the shanty again, was known as Rouse's Point Junction. And it basically allowed Rutland passengers to get off and transfer to the DH. So it had this little shack at the station, I guess. Or at least they provided something. And this is a little uh, close up view of it. And that board and back has some nice little details on the bracket. Another view of that. I mean, it looks in better condition than the previous one. Um, again, it's a place for passengers to get off the road and go on to the view of now, we think these are the station agents. We don't know. There was no caption with it, but it looks appropriate for standing underneath their station sign. And just to give you an idea, here's the B&H station, and you can just see the crossing shanty right there, and that's where the Rutland cross. <coughs> now, it's kind of, if you go out there today, it's kind of hard to locate, so this photo I thought was helpful to give you an idea of where it crossed. This is number 403 crossing the DNH in the spring of 1952. Cars at the right are on the interchange, interchange track from the DNH yard. Because these track cars here. Of course, the best laid plans, you know, accidents do happen. At this point, the Rutland's been pulled up, the B and H is left, but there's nothing left of the Rutland. So we're about to say goodbye to Rouse's Point, and we're going to head west. Um, the main reason I put this in is because I'm going to show you a picture of the creamery that used to be in Rouse's Point. And if you go up this road, over here, uh, go straight to the cemetery, and right behind this house, you can see remnants of an old foundation, which used to be the cream. <coughs> and this is the only picture we've been able to find of it. It was Lawrence Creamery. The Rutland stopped there, got milk, uh, loaded cans, unloaded cans. And this is a this picture taken around 1920. And it's a fairly substantial structure. And if you go there and see what's left behind that person's garage, you can still see concrete standing up. And it gives you an idea of basically the size of it. So we're going to head to Champlain. Um, we're coming from Rouse's Point. We're going by the, um, you know what that is? Sheridan. Sheridan. Yeah, right. Sheridan. Sheridan, Sheridan Ironworks there. And the station sits right about here. Just to give you an idea. And then. You'll also notice this set of tracks, which we'll talk about later. And this is an aerial view. I'll get you oriented. Here's the Sheridan Iron Works. Here's the tracks coming from Rouse's Point going up in the station.
Plattsburgh State. And I called him up and said, do you have any pictures of the ONLC or anything in Champlain? He said, oh yeah, we have this wonderful collection taken by this family. And I said, great. And I went down and daughter in front of the station. And son and daughter leaving to go to school in front of the station. So I said, oh wow. So I pulled out these photos. Of course, they were a close-up of the daughter and the mm -hmm. son. You couldn't see the station. <laughs> so my hopes were dashed. Then I read in this in the book that had a bunch of pictures about uh, I gotta get this right. um, Cook's planing mill. I didn't think anything of it. Had a bunch of pictures, so I didn't even worry about it. Didn't go. Of course, then I find this map, which went down to Cook's planing mill, which is down here. And if you go down there today, in fact, if you go down. This road continues to cross now. If you go down this road and look across, you can actually see where the road bed went. And then when you get down here, you notice it's all very, very flat, like something used to be there. Um, I haven't gone back to see what they have for pictures for Cook's planing mill, but I figured I'd throw that in as a little tidbit because the tracks, of course, are no longer there. And if you Actually, if you go down to Sheridan and there's a road right here, you can actually see remnants of a rail bed right about here. And then it gets obliterated because of this. But then once you go, if you go down this road and look back, you can see a little of a rail bed. You see a shelf as it's dropping down in grade. And then down here, you really can't tell anything. But it's such an unnatural flat area that obviously that's where it was. So we're coming into Champlain from Rouse's Point. We're heading west. This was a shot taken. You can see just a corner of the roof of the station. What was really nice about this photo is that fence had been there for years. So if you didn't know where the station went, you could go there and you could see the fence. You got this picture saying, ah, the station was right here. Well, someone just went and chopped and took it all out. So all you see is little spikes, but it's still, you can still get an idea, so it sort of helps you place where the station was. <coughs> Laz. Yeah. Evan Trillo knows that. I don't know if anybody in the room knows him. He's a state trooper. He bought the fence. He took it down. Sure. Nobody stopped him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Man. This is an early picture of the Champlain Station. Uh, it's hard to see, but it kind of gives you an idea. We have some better pictures that are coming up. This is another view of it. Um, I think these are outhouses, the little windows. Here's uh, a later um, <coughs> picture of the station. The freight house in the back, which is still there. It's currently a residence. First people waiting for the train, a little girl. This may be that uh, that family, I don't know. Of course, the train's pulling to the station, there's a crowd. I mean, Champlain, New York, look at all the people. Of course, back then, it's the only way you could travel, either by buggy or by train. Or both, excuse me, or both. This is a picture of the freight house uh, before it became a residence. Fairly good size for Champlain. Of course, Champlain also had uh, its own rights. This was in 1916. What I find amazing is all the people just crawling around seeing what's going on. Um, in a lot of photos at the turn of the century, you'll see there'll be a train wreck locomotive on its side, thousands of people standing on the locomotive. It's like, it was the thing to do. Another shot of the wreck again, people trying to figure out what happened, the other side of the car that got flipped over. This is the creamery in Champlain. Uh, it's no longer there. There's a fairly modern creamery that's there, but I don't believe it's being used anymore. It just sits vacant. And the tracks are going along here. <coughs> I'm going to Moore's Village, which 
later became Moore's Junction. Uh, there was a connection. In this case, we're saying Montreal and Plattsburgh. It really became a DNH. And then Ivinsburg and White Champlain, which became the Rutland. This is an early view of Moore's Junction with DNH crossing the Rutland. There's the DNH there. Rutland's here. It's called Moore's Junction at that point. A lot of buildings. It was quite. Oh, I never noticed that little uh, yeah. planter was going on. Yeah. It was co quite a complex. A lot of buildings, a lot of things going on. Out in the middle of nowhere, two railroads meet and interchange. And the other thing I will show you. And just a side note the uh, people in Moore's actually were a little disturbed when the Northern Railroad built the Moore Station. It actually was about a mile out of the village at the time. The d &H came through a couple years later and built the connection to Montreal before the d &H came to Ross's Point. So the people in the village actually used the d &H more and they did the rub. So the, it went right through the center of town, right along the, if you look at the Blue Mill Restaurant, that little dirt road, that was the d &H. Here's a later view of the station, a little better picture. Not bad shape, has a little detail. Again, a bunch of support buildings, and you can just barely see the back right here the main age This is milk train number eight. This is in the spring of 1951. Um, nice little scene. You know, color, color photos are always great. This is in August of 63. It's not in great shape. What's kind of really neat about this building is, and you can't see it in this photo, but when the DNH crossed, it crossed at an angle. And so to help unload for freight cars, this wall is actually built at an angle. If you go there and see it, it's not a square corner, it's skewed. Where Morse Forks next. Uh, the original station burned in early 1900s and it was replaced with this station. Not a great photo, but it gives you an idea. This was sort of a typical Rutland station of its uh, later years. The hip roof, big long overhangs, uh, the nice big brackets, three bay windows, usually vertical side and then clapboard on the side. Very typical of the Rutland when they were doing their station. And this is when the Central Vermont owned or had control of the rubber. And I believe you can see a Central Vermont boxcar. It's hard to see, but you can see a Central Vermont boxcar in the back. This is a better view of that station from the side. Uh, the freight doors are open in the section house. The milk cans on the platform side. I never say this. Um, small little place, kind of neat though. Uh, amazing the photos we can find on this. Usually, small towns is kind of hard. <coughs> this station replaced an original station in 1924. <coughs> This is uh, engine 363. This is a water tank that's enclosed. Mm -hmm. It's taken on water. I'm sorry. Can we go back a second? My fault. This is the original station. It got replaced in 1924. I didn't want to. <coughs> this is a view of the water tank. This house is still there. It's a different color. The tank is gone. But there's a bunch of shrubs and bushes, and actually you can see some of the piers in the shrubs and the bushes. <coughs> okay, this is the station that replaced the original station. You can see the shadow of uh, the water tank. That house, which you'll see later on, is still there. Which is right there. Again, the tank's now gone. Um, that's where we located. But they had a bunch of shrubs covering all that stuff up. Uh, can we go back a second? And actually, actually go back one more. If you go there now, the foundation is left and it's complete. So if you go there, you can see the outline of where the station used to be.
engines, sorry, engines have been stalled for three days in Barcombe Cut, a mile and a half away. 50 to 60 men were employed to shovel the train out.
another view of the station. Actually, it can't be continued. Right? The water tower, there was a creamery, it still is in back. This is after it was taken from uh, sort of a two story station down to a one, which was a typical rough and roof station. Uh, the section house had been there for years, it's now gone. Power's gone, but it's there in that photo. This is after it was no longer used as a station, it had been boarded up. One of the very few photos that I've been able to find of inside the station, of any of the stations, people working really hard. I know that, that the shades are drawn on the windows, whether they don't want anybody to know they're in there or they're taking a nap or what's going on, but the desk is clear out of them. They're not working very hard. And what's the other thing that's interesting about this station is, can you go next one? Very few scenes of people working out at the station. You know, we had that one at Rouse's Point, but we took a guess. But this obviously is track gangs, and for some reason, Chateau they must have loved having their photos. Because he's taken here, you go to the next one. Young Labor. Young Labor, yeah. Find the box. Another one, you can just see the station in the corner. That's, yeah. That's Forrest. Is it Forrest? Well, yeah. I can move that. And Oh, in the heck there is. Yeah, there is. <laughs> and then this is another set of track games. He knows that because he was in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're going to say good night. We hope you enjoyed it. And I uh, hope you learned some stuff and you had fun. Thank you very much.
do have pictures, uh, Larry Mars has pictures of it when they tore up the tracks, and I think I have some. It's kind of sad, so we don't like to bring them out. Oh, we have to, but yes, there is some pictures of Empire's tracks from Ross Point Champlain. If we ever do this again, we'll include those. You were there? Uh, we do have some membership applications to the Rutland Railroad Historical Society up there if anybody's interested in joining that group. I think it's $15 or $20 a year. They meet once a year along uh, different places along the Rutland Railroad, some places in Vermont. First in Vermont, a lot of the Rutland's still intact. And uh, all the way up to Oxford. Every year they have it at the convention in a different place, about 100 people a year. At that. Thank you very much. We hope